the studio edition of uh, Startup Grind. We have here uh, Ashkan, who's with us. Can I call you Ash? Ash is fine. I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> so Ash here is uh, the CEO and founder of uh, Watch Mojo. Watch Mojo is an online company uh, produced over 22,000 videos, uh, over 15 billion views in total, and 35 million subscribers, and over 150 million uh, views, uh, unique views, I think, per month? Unique viewers. Unique viewers per month. So uh, if you can all uh, join me and give a round of applause to our grinder here today, Ash. Thank you, Ash, for uh, My pleasure. joining us tonight. So why don't we start, you can give us a bit of a background. So uh, where you're from, what's your background stories, your parents and all that, just sure. to get to know you. So born in Iran. Tehran, 1978, six months later, a revolution. My dad, you know, his mom passed away at two, dad at 15, so you can imagine very different set of challenges. Uh, by 1983, the Iran-Iraq war is going on, and by then he had kind of found himself working at the Spanish embassy. And at least this is the story I tell, and I think it's largely accurate, but because he was an Iranian working for a Western government whose allies were on the side of Iraq, the government was all ultimately not comfortable with that. So, and he also saw that, uh, you know, in a few years, my brother who's here and myself would be ending up going to the military, and there the military is very different, you usually end up not coming back, right? So he kind of said, let's head out to uh, Spain. So a lot of people left the country, much harder uh, conditions. We left, I mean, I vividly remember on Iran Air and Lufthansa and stuff. So, <clears throat> again, very fortunate in that sense. And we went to Spain for a year, and he had a lot of experiences, but I guess, you know, in his DNA too, he had that entrepreneurial drive. And Spain and Europe are great places to live, especially as you look at work-life balance. But he wanted to be an entrepreneur. He wanted to go into business. So he liked, uh, you know, he looked at India, like India, Costa Rica, U.S., and Canada. And he spoke many languages. At one time, I've seen a picture of him serving as the translator to the former Queen of Iran. So he liked Montreal for what makes Montreal so unique is that it's bilingual. So we came here, and that was '84. And I grew up here, you know, growing up, we were defined by these things that happened that seemed inconsequential. I remember like in 1986, this lady comes in and she's selling encyclopedias. And I'm like, oh, my dad's going to throw her out. But he ended up buying encyclopedias. And I ended up, you know, before Wikipedia, reading so many stories. And, you know, as much as you tell yourself, oh, I'm not really good in school and I don't read and stuff, it was not true. I was actually a prolific reader. Um, and so develop this encyclopedia-like knowledge of facts, which later on would come in handy. It's, you know, we run a factual publisher. Stayed in Montreal, was always, I love the city, and uh, went to Concordia, and even that was, you know, everything happens for a reason. I was, uh, my older brother went to McGill, so I obviously had to go to McGill, go become a consultant or investment banker, because that's what you're supposed to do, until you realize what that entails, and then you're like, we'll see. But I ended up also getting into McGill, the Bachelor of Arts. I was a good student, never really opened books. I had a 72 in math, which didn't let me get into the uh, School of Management at McGill. So I was like, oh, Concordia, what's that? But Concordia, this was still like 95, I ended up doing 96 to 99, and Concordia was starting to have the better uh, practical, uh, you know, John Molson School of Business was the more hands-on, real-life kind of school. And I remember like having to swallow my pride and you know, I was like, but, you know, the other kids go to Concordia. You know, so again, like, th these things that don't seem that important. And that gave me this chip on my shoulder, this, like, as if I needed any help. Um, and so, ended up studying finance. But before that, when I was at Marinopolis, I loved social sciences, loved psychology, history, um, you know, written three books that are almost historical more than anything else. But people, when they ask me, like, what are the lessons that help you day to day, obviously there's a lot of business lessons, but a lot of them are history. You know, you look at how military planners, how people in entertainment history like hit an obstacle and they solve it. But sociology and psychology, I mean, understanding how human beings think, understanding interpersonal, that helps you so much more in business and just in life when like, you see somebody is clearly struggling, you see somebody has an issue. Um, so all to say, I basically ended up in this you know, position where graduating from Concordia, it was almost like a no-brainer that I would go down into business and finishing finance, uh, I wanted to do Dominion Securities Investment Banking. I, was, I got a job at Royal Bank Visa doing customer service, which I loved, and I've always been very customer service driven. But again, 
You're 20 years old, you're studying finance, obviously you think in five years you're CEO of the bank or you're like VP, SVP at RBC, Dominion Securities, because you know everything, you know, you read a book and you're... Um, but, but I was such a good customer service rep that once I graduated, the manager was kind of like, okay, the joke is over, I don't need to tell you, there's no way we're letting you go because you're a very good employee. So I resigned and I remember I got this job at Mama. Mama, remember Mama, yes. Former colleague, 20 years ago. So, again, Mama, I was like, what the hell is Mama? You know, you go to their website, it was right before Christmas. They had I was just like, could you, you could imagine the worst looking designed website in 1999, but before Google was known, this was crushing it. It was profitable, it had unique viewers, it was like a Carlton Concordia student named Herman Tumorjoglu who ended up like building this and Sun was part of the team, the, design, the, the technical team, and it was actually something, right? Um, so I remember going like, but I want to work for Goldman Sachs, you know, because again, you believe these things that your career should look like. And I remember like asking a lot of people, and my brother going, look, he's like, I work at Anderson now, and we're all eventually realizing that this thing called the internet is going to be a thing. So he's like, you know, if, if RBC Visa is not referring you to Dominion Securities, and Goldman Sachs is not returning Ashcan Karbasushen's letters, you know, on Wall Street job offers. He's like, just bypass spending a couple years in traditional fields and just go work at Mama. So start working at Mama, um, and I realized I loved the startup landscape. I was working for the CEO and the CFO who didn't want to work on business plans and didn't want to work on PowerPoints, and here I was talking, as you can imagine, imagine me writing, and I was just like, it was an opportunity. Um, so I quit RBC, started working at Mama, September 11, 2000, a year before 9-11. And then the NASDAQ blew up and everything you could imagine got Googled. And then what I realized was I didn't want to be in a support role. I wanted to be hands-on, a deal maker, creating things, creating value. And during Sank Assets, when we were, again, small world, we were going to like first Tuesdays and all that, I ended up running into three guys I went to school with. And they're like, what are you up? I, went, I was at Concordia with these guys. And they're like, so what are you up to? And Mama was like this big thing in Montreal at the time. So they were like, look, we started this online men's magazine called Ask Men. We need a guy like you who can just talk forever and is an extrovert, even though I thought I was shy. Like, I was tell people I'm very shy, which I am in certain sense. And so they were like, just come and uh, do a bunch of stuff. And I wanted to start writing, and I wanted to do like a bunch of different things. And I started without asking too many questions. And on day one, I realized they weren't making any money and they may go out of business soon. And I was like, I got to roll up my sleeves and work with these guys to build, build value. Okay. There's a lot there. <laughs> so how do you become a writer? Is it because of all the, the, the knowledge, all the reading that you had that you instinctively knew how to write, how to tell a story? There's a lot of times in my childhood where like we go camping, I'm sitting in a tent and like my grandma's telling a story or my uncle would kind of you know hold court and tell stories. So I think the storytelling is probably in my DNA and upbringing. Um, obviously reading helped. You know, the choices we make, so I have two daughters, one 11 and one 8, they're picking which high schools to go to, and it kind of hits you where you're like, wow, if my older brother would have gone to Notre Dame, and I would have followed him at Notre Dame, which was a sports heavy, I probably would be, like, gotten a, a scholar scholarship to go and play very different, but I went to Ma Vie de France, which had, ironically, it was a lycée français, but a tremendous, like, English program, and having watched a lot of hockey in English, I was, you know, it's fine. So, I remember that again, it's not a coincidence that you find yourself where you do, it's you just have to be aware of these things that impact you. So yeah, I think at Marie France, ended up actually allegedly reading a lot of these classics, even though I wasn't reading them, but I was reading the Cliff Notes or the Coles Notes, but I was kind of like developing these skills that I didn't know, and I would be writing these columns, sending them to Fortune magazine, and they were obviously not reading them, but at Ask Man, it was like, you know, an orgy of opportunities where I could kind of live out my fantasies, hold on, both as a writer, <laughs> aspiring, but also as this like deal maker where they were like, you can do whatever you want. You want to pursue ad deals, you want to pursue partnerships. And I would just went crazy. And so for like 2000 to 2005, I wrote 10 articles in a 14 day cycle for five years. So that's a lot of articles. I interviewed like 500 celebrities like Joe Montana, Hugh Hefner, 
many others. <clears throat> I wrote a couple books. I was part of a team. That was also the thing. It was kind of like I recognized an opportunity and I knew what everybody's strength was. Um, and so I developed this like prolific columnist. And you know, if I would have insisted to write under my own name, I would probably be better known as a columnist, but I understood why the guy who's writing dating advice shouldn't be writing management tips, shouldn't be the sport. It's like those sitcoms where the town mayor is also the hotel receptionist, is the cop. So I kind of swallowed my pride again and said, but it was a good opportunity because they would have said, yeah, we can't write these six articles in a week under your name. That's going to make us look really small. But so I realized that I was just, you know, I was writing at a prolific pace and that always continued and it helped me writing emails, memos, presentations, and over time when we get into these legal disputes over rights with rights holders, I think they were like, okay, this guy can write and read through so much information and turn it around. It's gonna cost us $3 million, and he's sitting there laughing probably. So again, it's, it's a combination of all these things, just have to be aware of it. And then we move, so you mentioned Asma in 2005, 2006, you decided to, to launch your own company, watch Mojo going from writing articles to creating video content. How did that come to your mind? How that was a straight you... line. No, it wasn't at all. So I, when we got 2004 Euro starts, my three partners, two of whom are Portuguese, go to Portugal for the Euro, I'm alone, get an email from, I like how this is an email, get a call or an email from IGN, which was a much larger San Francisco-based company, and they're like, we want to buy you guys. So I kind of made a few initial discussions, and I said, you should talk to them. They bought us. And the plan was that I would kind of like change roles. That's when, as much as I got along with the, 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 my, my boss, the CEO, these, this was like three co-founders. You can imagine the dynamics between them that I wasn't really aware of because we're all very head in this. And then I had my own friction with the others just because imagine living with somebody for five years and working with them. It's just like, and so I was like, okay, and I called the myth of the entrepreneur, meaning from the outside, everybody assumes the entrepreneur is more important than the team. You know, whereas on the inside, there's other people that obviously play a big part, right? So like at Ask Ben, that was a key part. Again, one of many, we all had different roles. I wouldn't say my role was more important. It was just easier to measure because it was like output and sales. But so I was like, okay, I'm not dumb. I've actually been, it's funny, I, I'm, I'm unaware of opportunities, ironically, even though I hit on YouTube early. But I'm very aware of like, ooh, these dynamics. So I said, when iGen buys us, they're going to kind of put Rick, the CEO, on a pedestal, rightfully so. He's not going to need me anymore. He's going to push me to the side. So I started to look at my exit plan. And initially, like my wife and I at the time, we, were, we just got married. We're like, maybe we move to London and do IGN biz dev for the, the group. But then what happened was uh, News Corp came along. Rupert Murdoch got into a fight with Summer Redstone at Viacom. And they were buying MySpace and IGN. I was in New York one day, tired of working for Ask Man. I was, I was literally getting sick having to think to go to work because I was like, I, I'm, my time here is over, I don't like this, there's no challenge, how many more articles can I write on picking up girls or, you know, like, you know, you know or like how to handle uh, an interview, you know, I've done it for a while. And we're standing there on Times Square and a guy that I had hired who would then get picked over me to go to New York to do the job I wanted, which is all cool, things happen for a reason, he's like, News Corp buys? IGN. He's like, isn't IGN our parent? I'm like, oh. I was like, okay. It's basically freedom, but now we're going to be forgotten. So I went up to the IGN guys and said, look, I've already kind of started my transition. I don't really have a job here anymore, and I don't want to just collect the salary. So I said, why don't I start where you guys are all going to have a pain point, which is video. I said, I consider video to be empty calories. Like, I've never shot or edited video. But that's a good challenge, how to storytell in video, because the world is already moving from uh, TV, print to online. And you could see rise of mobile. There was many false alarms with mobile. And it took the iPhone, really. And I said, look, clearly video is growing. I go, I hate consuming content in video. But I can see that this is going to be a thing. Uh, so I'll head up this kind of labs where I'll produce videos for IGN, for Ask Men, for all your brands. And they were like, OK. <clears throat> but when News Corp bought us, they were like, we can't invest in anything because News Corp just spent $650 million. They don't want to change a thing. So I was like, what if I go and I start this separately? And if you guys want, you can invest. I made a couple hundred grand, which in Montreal is a lot of money. It's a fortune, but compared to our peers in New York and LA, it's around here. It's a, it's a couple drinks at a bar, you know? But I also never want to not mention that because it's disingenuous to sit here and be like, as an entrepreneur, I started with no venture capital. Okay, quarter million dollars back in 2006 was a good sum, you know? And so they were like, okay, don't do two things. I was like, go on. They're like, don't go launch something to compete with IGN. 
No, they said don't go work for GameSpot, which is IGN's competitor, and don't go work for like Massive, which is Askren's competitor. I said, no, I'm going to start something that's going to be very broad. It's video and all that. They're like, great, we don't care. Go do your thing. Three months later, knock, knock, there's a postman who's like, hey, what's up? Sign. I sign. Open it. Fastcam. I've never heard of Fastcam. They're like, hey, we represent IGN. We also represent Askman. We're watching you. You're violating your non-competition. Please act accordingly. I'm like, let me go read my non-competition. My non-competition says don't do a men's online magazine. It's very clear. I speak to a couple lawyers, knew a few, and they're like, yeah, you're not violating your non-competition. This is really hard to prove. Like, it's, don't have to worry. But they're clearly trying to intimidate you, or they're trying to like, force you to sell to them. I'm like, no, this is just frivolous, meritless. It's, it's guys acting dumb, right? Two months later goes by, we're still doing our thing, like how to, you know, like women's fashion advice, travel, but yes, how to tie a tie. Certain things that poke the tiger. Knock, knock, now it's a bailiff, this much papers delivered. So, your injunction to shut us down, provisional injunction. I was like, okay. I go outside, my wife and I had started the business, we had like five employees, we're losing like $50,000 a month. We're like beyond a dinky operation. But Rupert Murdoch wants to kill us. So, <clears throat> and I had to show up to court the next day, by the way. So show up to court the next day. And like Mr. Bean, I like read up all these legal leads thinking like, oh, I'm gonna blow them away with my legal advice. So I'm standing there and I'm looking at the, my, the Maître Sinat, who was then also the Batonier in Montreal. They have like an army of lawyers. I'm there with my little bag there, you know. And so I'm looking at them like, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Like not literally kill me if everybody's recording, but like I'm going to de destroy you. Like bring it on, you know? It's like Messi versus Ronaldo, but it's like Messi versus Mr. Bean, you know? I have no idea. <laughs> I have zero idea of anything I say in a sense. So we go up in front of the judge, and the judge is confused. He's like, Rupert Murdoch, Fox? Ashcan, Carbis from Shen? He's like, what is this? So anyway, they're like, long story short, they're like over a technicality. They're like, you got to go fix this. And I was like, ooh, maybe it'll just go away. An hour later, knock, knock, it's fixed. It was like a sitcom. So again, you don't want to pretend like you're a self-made to the point. But so I was like, okay, it's a problem. I'll deal with it. So I had a day or two to read. I remember waking up thinking this would go away. It wouldn't go away. My mother, uh, sorry, my father-in-law was like, talk to this lawyer. She may be helpful. I'm like, I'm probably a divorce lawyer, some house lawyer, whatever. She calls me back, met her Olga Kutsuris. So I was like, hi there. I'm like, what, what do you specialize in? She's like, oh, I'm like an injunction specialist. I'm like, what? Injunction. So she's going on and I'm reading the first few lines and she's like, oh, these big law firms, they, you know, they make mistakes, you know, everybody makes mistakes. She's like, oh, they're doing this. I'm like, hold on, I gotta meet you. So we go see her and Friday, she's kind of like coaching me and she's like, look, their, their strategy is just to outspend you. She's like, I could go in, but we're, it's like not really merits. It's an injunction. The judge is gonna take you in chamber and this is all Chinese to me. She's like, you may not even be in the room and your fate is sealed. The judge could grant an injunction, shut you down, and they'll drag their feet and you never go to court and that's it. So I was like, yeah, I guess you're saying my only strategy is if I represent myself, so I have to be in chamber to maybe plead a bit like ignorantly on the merits. And we all laughed. But I was like, wait a second, this is just basically a debating exercise. So I read up, prepared, and Monday I show up and I was like, they do their thing and uh, 40 minutes goes by, and I'm like, these are not very good arguments, to be honest with you. Like, I was a bit nervous, but then I was like, ah. So then I get up, I'm like, my lady, I'm here to demonstrate that petitioners don't pass the four tests of an interlocutory injunction. And they're like, what, 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 what is he talking about, you know? And I went on and on, a bit nervous, but just kind of routed them. And I wish there was this, like, David versus Goliath, this one big coup de grace that I kind of said, and eh, they can't handle the truth. It's not. It's like a debate. You're just trimming away. You're like, you know, petitioners claim that we may cause risk. Well, pose a risk isn't a threat. And the judge was like, you're sure you're not a lawyer? I'm like, no, I just pretend to be one. And uh, she was like, come back tomorrow. And then we kind of won. And again, things happen for a reason because that gave me so much confidence in the ensuing debates we had with rights holders over fair use. And so we knew we were onto something. And, you know, we, we kind of knew that storytelling was moving towards video. And in the earliest iterations of Watch Mojo, we were super horizontal because we wanted to avoid getting sued. Irony hashtag there. We didn't want to be just like, oh, we're going to cover men's topics or anything. We purposely wanted to be so broad. Like how to make a diaper cake for a shower. And I remember going, a diaper cake? Who reads that? And my wife was like, I don't know. 
Don't worry, don't worry, we'll film it, right? So my wife and I started the business, which already doesn't make sense, and we, we recruited three other co-founders, and the five of us are still there 14 years later. So again, very different. And obviously, something happened around 2012 when we kind of shifted strategies and then took off. So what happened in 2012? So in 2006, there was a lot of investors that actually early on were kind of like impressed with my background. You know, Ask Man was a relative success in content, and we had taken on deeper funded competitors and like trounced them. A lot of luck and timing, but you could spin it as we knew what we were doing. But so they were like looking at it. The lawsuit scared them away. You know, so they, were, they weren't interested in funding my bills to whoever it was that was advising us. Um, and so we were very horizontal, and I thought I was actually very focused, right? That's very relative. I thought it was like, well, we do video, that's our focus. But they were like, no, no, no. Focus means you're like beauty or fashion or travel. That's what marketers want. And I was like, no, 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 I disagree. I was like, if you consume content through video, you're gonna consume a video on business, a video on travel, a video, this is 2006, right? It was before YouTube. I go, but if you're a reader of articles, you're gonna read across two or three of those verticals. You're never really gonna, I go, there's this wall right now. They were like, look, it sounds great, kid. Good luck with that business, pal. And I was like, okay. So I got turned down by a lot of VCs who were always like, look, and I don't think they were lying about this. I think they were like, look, you seem like an interesting guy because you can read a PNL, profit and loss. I don't need to explain what that is here. But you can also be creative. So they were like, that's really, really valuable. But we don't like your business. We don't see it scaling. You know, I was always obsessed with scale, even though I learned things that scale quickly are not sustainable. And things that are sustainable tend to you know, take a long time to, to grow. But so you get rejected like a hundred times. And to John Stokes' credit at Real Ventures, when I, I quoted him in my book about something, in my third book, which talks about YouTube, uh, and you're all welcome to get a free copy if you'd like uh, as a PDF ebook I could send you. But the point was, he's like, you gotta stop saying that lie. I'm like, what, what, what lie? I don't lie. He goes, no, he goes, I offered you money. You can disagree that it was a crappy deal, but don't say nobody ever offered you money. And I'm like, you're right. And then I thought of Tony Robbins, whom we can't quote anymore because hashtag me too, but Tony Robbins had this line about you are the stories that you tell yourself. And I had always told myself that everybody rejected me and nobody wanted to fund us, but I was like, yeah, okay, it's not really true. We didn't get the kind of deal that we want, but which entrepreneurs get the deals that they want? I still had the fact that I had a little bit of a war chest, we ran out of money, but I could parlay, you know, having studied finance, I was really very lucky, that's not what is it, I was very lucky to parlay my accounting know-how, marketing know-how into setting things up properly and not making a lot of mistakes entrepreneurs do, that they're like, yeah, accounting's boring, it's like, yeah, but guess what, you're gonna go to jail because you didn't pay your taxes, you know, how cool is that, you know, so you have to use the skills that you have, but after getting rejected a hundred times, I was like sitting in Madison Square Park, and I was talking to this uh, gentleman who was kind of serving as our advisor, banker, and he goes, you know, are you gonna do what this VC said, which is I'll give you like half a million dollars if you become a beauty and fashion vertical. I was like, no. But I go, you know what? I had coffee with Troy Young, who's now the president of Hearst. I had, you know, I met Shane Smith, who's the founder of Vice. They all said the same thing, and it's time that I listen. I gotta get more focused. But I said, I'm still gonna stick to what I think makes sense, because I gotta show up and work here. Yeah. So I said, I'm gonna define focus as, what does the world need right now? The world needs going short attention span, going to YouTube, going to video. I was like, what YouTube does not need is two things. Another multi-channel network, that you can just look up MCN to figure out why. And another vlogger. Somebody who's sitting there and telling you why they love or hate George Bush or hot dogs or, there's way too many of them. And with advances in this technology, it's gonna be really easy to produce this. And I get it, we shouldn't be producing fashion tips because Michelle Phan can produce a million more of makeup tips than we can. And what we should produce is we should rely on our relationships with rights holders who for five years have been working with us to do interviews with Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber, or interview their actors and directors, I am totally crazy enough to jump on this grenade that is fair use and copyright exemptions around you know, using short snippets of clips and bigger features. And I can parlay my way to negotiate and avoid getting sued. And I'm not a martyr, despite I guess being from Iran, I'm not crazy enough to be like Gawker, where we're like, I'm gonna be a martyr of freedom of expression or whatever. 
So I'll navigate that well, and I think what we should do is have like these really factual, we're doing top 10 Ozzy Osbourne, these are his greatest tunes, and you know, we'll explain to you objectively why these are his best tunes, and there's nothing like it on YouTube. Don't forget, in 2011, if somebody searched for Batman on YouTube, there was a girl dressed as Batman and a guy talking about Batman in his basement with like really crappy SD phone technology. So we would come out and we're like top 10 Batman moments and you see like the Joker smashing a pen and people. And I was like, it's a matter of time before I hear a knock on the wall and it's Marvel or DC threatening nuclear jihad on us, like legal jihad, like just, we're gonna take you down. But what I could also see was these companies internally had marketing departments that were trying to get these IP value out they were stuck with people who were a bit older, more old school, who didn't trust the internet, let alone YouTube. And so they couldn't really just release it and do stuff. This was before MCU was, you know, we're working on our next documentary called How Geek Culture Became Pop Culture. You know, if a decade ago I would have told you that like Big Bang Theory was a top rated show or Marvel MCU was going to destroy the box office, you would have thought I was crazy. You would have said, those are niche things for geeks. That's not gonna make any money. So we foresaw that, right? Watch Mojo was a perfect proxy on that. So there was this little tug of war inside these companies that was like, who are these Watch Mojo guys? And then they'd be like, they're from Montreal. Like, ah, oh, we don't even, like, they're not in LA. Like in LA, nobody would have, people would have shame to do what we did, I admit. They would be like, well, we can't just use their IP because I'm gonna run into this person somewhere and they're gonna be like, aren't you guys ripping off our, how do you get that DVD, you know? Don't ask us how we got the DVDs in the early days, you know? But the point was, what we were doing was legal. And that's the other thing. YouTube became successful because it never asked for permission. And there was a saying, it's easier to ask for forgiveness and permission, which I don't really adhere by because eventually your wife's like, yeah, we're gonna have a chat about that. That's not really like a philosophy I'm gonna sign off on. But the point is, you don't ask for permission. Nobody's sitting there trying to find your path to success. You know, you know fortune favors the bold and all that. So, we built this business and ultimately it was a perfect proxy for what you've seen in the last decade with Game of Thrones and all these things. You know, you go on the front page of CNN and you got Game of Thrones. That's kind of weird. It's like siblings having sex and like a crazy woman killing a bunch of children. I, I don't watch Game of Thrones, but if I explain that to you, you're like, yeah, I don't think that's on CNN. But that's super mainstream, you know, and I think these are like fantastic, you know. But you're like, what? They ate a baby or whatever, you know. So, so this has been this transformation of society that Kind of, I, you know, recognize and capitalize on. Perfect. So, you were mentioning 2012 being a pivot moment for you guys. How, how well did things go pick up from? Uh, so, 2006 to 2012, we lost 898 thousand dollars in accumulated losses, but I didn't really pay myself much. So, as I was absorbing the salary of like a CEO, CFO, council chief, creative janitor, and all that, that our peers in the U.S. were probably paying two, three, four, five million dollars a year. So we are what I call the third wave of video producers. First wave is like pop.com from Steven Spielberg, pseudo. Second wave is mania heavy. We're in the third with uh, Revision 3, which did Dig Nation and Next Two Networks. There's a fourth. Right now we're like the Empire Strikes Back mold, where like Marvel's coming back. Jimmy Kimmel, all these old media companies are embracing YouTube. They're like, we're gonna fuck, sorry, we're gonna dominate this platform. Um, so the idea was, I was like, we're, we're fine, and I knew we were the envy of all of our competitors. That, you know, when you go to conferences, you're competing, but in content, it's not zero sum. Like, Mark Zuckerberg would eat, you know, Google's children just for fun. You know, it's a lot more competitive, it's zero sum. Content guys, you're kind of like, oh, you suck, we're better, but you need each other, and it's like, if you're going to Barcelona, you're gonna read five articles. So I knew that they were burning money, and they were like, my, my VCs are like getting tired. Meanwhile, we were like, oh, you know, our, our annual, sorry, our monthly costs are 50,000 bucks, which to you fine folks at accounting and to our lawyers, they're like, Ash, I know wonderful psychologists. There's this great place they'll take you and they'll get you better. Because they're like, how could you lose all this money? But I was like, no, losing a couple hundred grand in this industry is, is a year is, it's nothing. It's a wild night in Vegas. I'm kidding. I don't party in Vegas. You know, but, but again, you've got you to block out some of the noise. I go, don't believe your biggest critic. Don't believe your biggest fan because they don't really, and don't believe necessarily anybody, frankly, to some extent, you know, be selective. But so it took a while, but because we had built this big catalog, once we hit, to use a finance jargon or accounting, once we kind of hit that breaking point, we had a lot of degree of operating leverage. 
you know, we, we were like doing, you know, one year we had 80% EBITDA, which made no sense. But then we also then had to reinvest quickly and we should, there was reasons for that. But then we built this like really profitable machine. But my kind of takeaway was I never had a venture back firm. I wasn't building this unicorn. And I don't even think content companies become unicorns. Like, you know, the expression Warren Buffett, I think, says you don't put nine women in a room and say, we're going to give birth to them. It's a great plan. That's a plan made by dude. You know, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Content is the same thing. So su successful content brands are built over decades. You know, but so in our case, I say my mantra was, you know, I didn't pay myself. We still gave big, full big, full time job salary jobs, paid vacation, health plans. Granted, we weren't hiring ninja coders who cost an arm and a leg. We're hiring like creatives from Concordia that admittedly didn't have another job. But again, being contrarian, I was like, we got to be really nice to them because they're not going anywhere. There's not that many jobs. I don't see CBC hiring. I don't see Gazette. People are like, what? So, but I go, well, that's not that strange. You've got to be nice to people you expect are going to be around for a while. You know? But I always said, so we put people at a profit, but we also kind of put profit ahead of revenue. Mm -hmm. In our world, that made sense for us. You guys could be in a different industry where you got to just think of market share and eventually just revenue because you need that VC. So a lot of these tips you also have to kind of apply to your reality. Yeah. <clears throat> And in generally, let's say in terms of operations now, when you when your company started scaling and started producing more and more videos, how what were the challenges there in scaling? This? So we never had this challenge of uh, recruiting. We're very lucky that in Montreal, you know, the dynamics work for us. And I remember when I went to like the first tech crunch to Strap, there was a lot of VCs who are very smart. Like I know VCs have a bad rap, and maybe only one percent are making money. Then there's a lot of posers, but there's good and bad in anything. But a lot of VCs kept saying the same thing. They're like, you gotta go where the capital is, and you gotta go where the engineers were. That's true, but in our case, I was like, you know what, the supply dynamics. There were two, there were two kind of questions I asked myself when I started the biz. I said, I could probably start something where I could make revenue really easy, but it's gonna be boring. I'll have a very hard time recruiting. I'll always have high turnover, and I'll have to overpay people to do something that I will eventually jab like a knife in my neck for. That's not a life I want. I said, or I could start a business that I think will be really fun, but I have no idea what it's gonna look like. I don't even know if it'll make money. But I know that I could create a great environment and I could almost like push people away. You could imagine which one I picked. The second one, right? So we never had a hard time recruiting, um, but I also, the fact that I work with my wife, work with the same founders, tells you everything. I'm very driven, you could say, I'm, some people find me annoying and sell a lot of people, I'm sure. But the people that matter are like, Ash is a pretty reasonable, compromising guy. Like he's a bit excitable and you know whatever, idealistic, sometimes too much. But nobody will say a lie, nobody will say certain things. So I never had a hard time recruiting. But it was really hard because there was no revenue in the industry. In 2006, there was no revenue. Nobody was advertising a video, nobody knew what the hell they were gonna do. When Google bought YouTube, I wrote, I was writing for TechCrunch, I wrote it's the greatest m and of all time, and now everybody repeats that. Was an obvious one, but it was you knew what was going to happen. Google was going to leverage its infrastructure, its legal, its resources, and its advertisers went from, you know, classifieds to search, and eventually from search to display and uh, videos. It was going to eat it all up. And TV companies, not because they're stupid, but because of innovators' dilemma and not having an economic incentive, were going to stay on the sidelines. So our challenge was there was no revenue. So that way we had to kind of bide the market. And then it was really about, for us, balance. How do you ba balance quality where you don't think you're the New York Times, but you don't want to become a content farm where you're like, a VC is like, I'll give you a check if you could somehow automatically create a thousand videos in a day. I was like, I got news for you. Those thousand videos are going to suck. And you're going to have a lot of turnover. And you can create maybe the screen for this phone in India, but you can't get the same content produced in India or some low cost place where you envision shifting people. So the biggest, balance, the biggest challenge, and this is violin time, was sticking to your values, your principles, the things that led you to start a business. But how hard was it to stick to that, like through the tough times? Well, it was super hard. Like, well, it was, my life was constant. I used to like, wake up always like, thinking, wow, I'm finally going to make payroll. And every two weeks, I had, if there was like, a US postal strike, not everybody sent wires even then. That's, like, if somebody didn't send a check, it was like you had to go somehow you know, sell something to the bank. Like, it was hard. It was nonstop. And I don't think people appreciate that. But I was in the trenches. I couldn't just turn off and go, I'm going to go on a beach. I'm going to go meditate and do yoga. There's nothing wrong with that. But I would have then just had, like, a massive, like, $700,000, like... Because, don't forget, I had two hundred. If, if you know accounting, I told you I had $250,000, but if we lost $900,000, well, where do you think the rest came? No, not loan sharks. The banks. So I owned so much money, and I was always 
paranoid that my plane would crash and my wife would somehow be like, surprise, you now owe $670,000. So constantly, like, we get these young employees who are like, well, I'm going to leave if I don't get more money, and I really need a health plan now, and hey, what's up with paid vacation? Can I get more? And you're sitting there and you're kind of like trying to focus, but you're like, okay, so in like seven days, I got to somehow come up with $50,000. But you do that for seven years. Mm. Like now, and it's good, mental health is a thing. Like it's the same way you get hurt as you get older. Like, but the stuff that, you know, I could have written that book and you got to kind of keep it in composure. But I also felt I was the luckiest person on planet Earth. I thought I was the richest and experienced and all that. But that was the main struggle. It was nobody believed in what we were doing. And everybody kept repeating to me that I was an idiot for doing what they didn't believe that I was doing. And you still have to say, and people say, well, why didn't you pivot? Well, in content, I knew it would take time. And I could see those who were pivoting would pivot so much that they would end up in the same position. And I knew also, that, to be fair, it wasn't like I was like running a print magazine where I was like, no, 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 no it's going to come back. They're going to buy, like, there's a lot of that. It was like, no, that wasn't the case. I knew the future was going to YouTube. I knew video was going to win. I knew that if I kept costs down and kept the core team together, that it was a matter of time. Even a broken clock is right twice, and that's what happened. Ultimately, whereas I thought the light at the end of the tunnel was 2009 or 10, it was always an oncoming train, it was 2011. We minimized our loss. 2012, we broke even. 2013, we're like, wow, we're pretty profitable. Now there's a trailing indicator where like, your account's payable comes much later, whereby for two years I was still in shell shock mode, where I was like, no, no, no. And then that stress replaced with, shit, we're making good money, like not unicorn money, but good boutique or lifestyle business money. Then I was like, we have all this fair use exposure. So my anxiety and paranoia over losing, I mean, we had already ran out of money. We were like, I was writing the novel on insolvency, you know, surviving through insolvency. But then it was like, well, someday we're gonna get sued. Then I was like, well, if we don't get sued, YouTube's just gonna shut us down. Then I was like, oh, and then at some point I was like, you're an idiot. Like, it's good to be paranoid and it's good to be this like sense of survival and outsider. It's good to have a chip on your shoulder. But you know, what's the point, you know, get rich. And I'm not driven, and entrepreneurs are not driven by money. There's some insecurities that lead us to do what we do. But I was like, get rich or die trying is an expression. You don't actually want to die as you're trying to succeed. So something happened where in the last couple of years, I just kind of learned. And I was also always very zen. I'd get home and be cooking, listening to classical music or metal or rap and techno. And like you would be like, Ash is the most balanced person. He does sports and plays soccer and all that. But internally, it was just a lot. And I, sh I didn't really share. Like I worked with my wife so she could see what I would be like the pressure. And I like pressure, so I, but some of it is self-imposed. But the point is... You do get to a point, I'm 41 now, where sometime between 35, very slowly, and closer to 41, probably 40, uh, where I just said, you know what? It's good. So you're good. Everything here on out is bonus. You're very fortunate. You've always looked at perspective. Look at how crazy the world is right now. Yeah. You know, so you're, you do start to kind of appreciate it, and it helps kids. You know, I always said that I wasn't planning on having kids, but you start to kind of get to a point where you're like, you know what, if I could lead in 10% more into my kids as they're 11 and eight, these are the years where they're gonna define their confidence, they're all that, I could spend 10% less time working and you start to get real balance. You're always chasing balance, you never are in equilibrium, but eventually you start to kind of get in a more healthier state. Um, and we have a great team, right? And that's the thing, is eventually you go from like, I don't wanna disturb them, I don't wanna, sh I wanna shelter them, to like, they probably wanna help on these other things. They don't just want to be there. They want to be in the kitchen where the fire's happening and like you're being burnt by melted cheese and all that. They don't want to just be like, oh, here, this place right here. And that, that's, a, that's an ongoing thing. And when things were hard and all, do you ever think about moving out of Montreal, maybe get closer to LA, get closer to, to where the productions are, maybe get more yeah. traction and all? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, studying finance, my plan was to go to New York or, or Toronto or somewhere else. I think Montreal is the ultimate lifestyle business, if you think about it. Montreal, and this is good, made a decision in 76 that if you are a French Canadian, if you're Quebecois, the best jobs in, in the province should go to people who are the majority and who speak French. So I think that is in our DNA. And I like the fact that we're in Montreal. I've visited, very fortunate, so many cities. There's a reason I stayed here. And then I think we made a, another uh, decision where we kind of said, we're not just gonna grow for the sake of growth. We don't wanna become a London per se or a New York where you, it's so expensive that you have to travel three hours to get here. 
Now, it's not necessarily good in the near term for certain entrepreneurs and certain executives, but overall, when we're all dying on our deathbed, we're probably gonna have, I think, overall a better experience. But being in media, I won't be naive. I was like, I should probably be in New York or LA. And I was like, look, in 2008, now that a base is kind of solid, my wife and I, we had one daughter at the time, Roxy, she was just one. We went down to New York and spent realistically 60% of that year in, in, in New York. So we kind of lived there. Because we wanted a second child, we came back. But also I, I saw it that I go, you know what? They just don't like the business. It's not a VC model for them. It doesn't matter if I'm sleeping with them. I could be their butler. It doesn't matter. Like it's not the distance. For some it is. For us it wasn't. When I go to LA, LA every meeting is the same. There's a person you meet and that is the I love you, you love me, let's do a deal together guy. That guy then disappears and the deal dies with the cock locker, you know, you know, gatekeeper person. So I also realized that these are excuses we create in our heads. I was like, I could build this business in Montreal. And I could take all the weaknesses and threats and downsides of Montreal and use them to my advantage. So I decided to stay here because I also was traveling quite a bit. You know, 2011 and 10, I spent, you know, I was in New York 25 times. I lived on American Airlines 45, 21, you know? Like, so I travel, I personally go through these phases where I'm at conferences a lot, getting me there. But I also make sure I'm in the city a lot and I'm in my office. I think sometimes whenever you see an entrepreneur way too much at these conferences doing that circuit, usually in about six months you see that business went out of business. Because it gets to your head and you think you're changing the world, but I'm like, stay at home, change your kids' diapers and make sure you change the light bulb and you know, it just focus on the core, don't let it get to your head. So it goes back to balance, you know, like to succeed it's persistence in business, but to, to succeed in life as a human, it's, you better get balance and it's not hard. So for us, it didn't make sense to go to Montreal, uh, to leave Montreal. And it was an advantage because being, I, I tell people when they go, well, what's, what, what is Watch Montreal? Well, I go, it's the next media and entertainment export out of Montreal after Juste pour Rire, Cirque du Soleil, and Vice Media. You know, to Americans, I go, if YouTube replaced television and we're big on YouTube, we're like an ESPN or MTV in 1985. So it's like, we're big, how do we get bigger? And people are like, okay. Now that we're doing top tens, it doesn't matter. <laughs> top tens is like NBC having friends. It's a hit. How do you evolve and leverage that to do something else? You know, NBC is many things. At one time it was Seinfeld, it was Friends, it was uh, The Apprentice. So for us, the top ten, which we did not invent, Wayne's World, Letterman, Moses, and the Ten Commandments, was just something that I recognized was, yeah, deep thoughts. But that is basically, it's a format that mankind has been drawn to that nobody was doing. Uh, but if somebody comes to me and they're like, yo, man, I want to launch a top 10 channel on YouTube, I'm like, oh, I'll give you the playbook. It's called 10 Year Old Flight Success, an entrepreneur's manifesto, how Watch Mojo became basically what it did. But I'm like, there are other platforms now TikTok, Snapchat, Crapster, whatever. Go find something you're willing to do for five years, matter of speaking, that you're really good at, that you can motivate other people to do, that you would like do for free. Because freedom of expression may be a God-given right, but freedom to make a living from writing and creating videos is not. I know that bursts some people bubble, but that's the truth. The beauty of this and the beauty of the internet is everybody's a storyteller. And traditional media doesn't like to be told that. And the person that has been getting all these grants from Petro Canada or, or you know, BBC doesn't like to be told that. But it's very competitive. And I love that. I love exposing inefficient crap and people who were like, oh, I got a job at the Gazette to write because my mother works there. Yeah, well, you're going to not really be very successful in the real world where there's no barrier to entry, right? So yeah, so ultimately, I think it just has to be, you've got to balance. Don't lose your idealism because an entrepreneur, you need that. But don't also become a cynic where you do become after, you know, a bit more experience and war torn, you know, missions. You've got to balance that. and. Stay true to the things that led you to start on your own. Speaking about the shift decisions now, maybe you can share what's one of the best decisions you've taken. One of this the worst not, also. So. I, it's not for everybody, I assure you. I don't even recommend this. For me, deciding to convince my wife to join me from day one, and then for a couple of years she was on mat leave, but she was always involved. For me, very personal, and I know this is being recorded, it's not like I'm trying to score more. For me, was the best thing. Because it was such a long journey, and other, and I have three other great co-founders, but it really allowed us to kind of at least understand what we're going through and find a weird balance. 
that I don't think I would have been able to do. And if she wasn't patient, at some point she's like, what is the point of this? Uh, that was the best decision for me. Uh, but it, when people go, do you recommend people going to work with their spouses? I go, no. Because human beings, we generally don't compromise. We generally don't admit when we're wrong. We generally uh, don't pick and choose our battles, Donald Trump. So if you can do those things, then working with your spouse is good. But if you're a rigid person that doesn't compromise, can't admit they're wrong, uh, then don't do that. So that was, for, for me personally, the best decision. The worst? <laughs> Too many to name. No, I mean, it depends, right? It's, or some bad ones. Maybe. No, it's not bad. I mean, regrets. Uh, I wish I would have pursued becoming a striker when I was young. I think I could have been a decent soccer player. But that's uh, more because I like the sports dynamics of team play. And that's what I, I kind of built Watch Mojo like a sports organization, right? Um, really, look, a lot. I've made a lot of mistakes. You know that cliche, Michael Jordan? I, I win every day because I fail every day. It makes sense. Um, the regrets, I, I, the, it's not so much regrets because you saw everything happens for a reason. I would just say more that like my mistakes tend to be uh, always when I'm rushed. I think it's just good to be like proactive and you know kind of like got, not hustle like get the hustle, but like always be a good pace, not to sit and dwell. But you should never feel rushed. And maybe I'm not choosing the right words, but if you're like in a haste and a panic, you're gonna make mistakes. So maybe being in a rush is good and you don't want to be in a haste or whatever. But generally, I've made so many mistakes. And it doesn't, as, but I also do, and that's the thing. The people that are like, if I had to do things differently, I wouldn't do anything differently. And I would pick different shoes, uh, different socks. It doesn't match. I change my shirt. If you know what I mean? Like, I would pick something different at lunch, right? And so the people that are so zen that are like, I would never change anything, I'm like, please. Doesn't sound very truthful, but sure. So you have to understand that mistakes are part of what you do. But you also, like, I, that's the one thing I've learned. I, the, the, the mistake, my biggest regret is letting, is dwelling on my mistakes. And that is really hard. I'm super good on my colleagues, live and learn. You know, I'm like, it's okay. Just let's not lie, let's figure out what happened. And because I didn't have outside investors, I was never looking to throw anybody under the bus. I was like, it's fine, what happened, let's move on. Like I don't have a tolerance for bullshit or when people are like dishonest or, or waste time and stuff because I see how much, what a great opportunity we have. But the number one regret now that I think about it is I'm just very hard on myself. I wish I could be with myself to be a bit more like, yeah, it's all good and just really not think about it. But I'd be lying, I do think about it. I'm constantly thinking back of mistakes. Uh, and I also have a mind that's always moving, so it's maybe only 20% of my mind, but uh, I wish I could block that out. And over time, I've gotten better because I see how lucky I am and how much I have and how fortunate I am. <clears throat> You're also mentoring a few startups now these days and all. You give advice, if it, you talk to people, you whether grab or not, a coffee or... Whether or not they want the advice or, uh, or ask for it. No. So the reality is I was always very active on that front, even when I was at Concordia. Like, when I left, I was like tutoring as a lecturer. I was lecturing as a teacher's assistant, and if I was a bit smarter, I would have just gotten a master's degree so I could eventually teach. Uh, at the time, I wanted to do that. Um, so I was always very involved. That's why I got involved in First Tuesday and did all this stuff. I did get to a point, and you saw this, where I felt like this is really just vanity. My time should be given to my team, my family. It's great that I'm out there, but these people don't even know who I am. And it's like, oh, kind of, not a waste of time, but. It, there's too much noise now in this. Like the, the whole angel, everybody was like an angel. Everybody was an angel investor. Everybody was an advisor. Everybody was a life coach for a while. Wow, what are you a life coach of? Like, if you know, it's like when you say I'm modest and I'm humble, you're usually not. If you're a life coach, you shouldn't actually say you're a life coach, right? So it kind of got where I was just like, so I, again, I lean in a lot, I'm out there, and then I kind of go back like Homer in the bushes. I'm like, this is you're driving me crazy. So I've always done that. In the last couple of years, I've gotten a bit more active to actually either invest, help with capital, help hands-on, but it's really to not drive my team crazy, to give them a bit more space. Because as an entrepreneur, you're impatient. There's no, you, you wake up on Monday morning with three ideas, by Wednesday, two of them exist, and maybe zero of them should be alive. You can't operate like that. So a few years ago, we recruited more senior people, and I said, look, I've got to give them leeway, I've got to give them runway. So I was like, okay, instead of just standing there, like twiddling my thumbs, I'm gonna help others and do other things. You know, and you can't always go up to your team, are you good? Can I get you something? They're like, why is my crazy boss that I've spoken to twice? And that's also the thing, that like your early employees know you are comfortable, they'll come and tell you like, yeah, don't say that again, it's crazy. 
Newer employees are not comfortable to say the most obvious thing. So that's also. But the point is, I have gotten a bit more out there. That is something I want to do. Um, it's something I'll probably do somewhat naturally. But um, yes, long live sentence. Well, let's say for entrepreneurs now that are having trouble getting traction in the market, getting uh, journalists to, if they want to have a, an article or something on the web posted, I know you used to be also a writer for TechCrunch. Uh, do you have any advice for them how to approach these people, how to uh, try to get the communication yeah. out? So journalists are always cynical by nature, and I think especially the latest crop of like millennial Gen Z uh, journalists are the most, because they also have like heavy student debt, and they see like you know post recession, all their friends for twenty years, these endless wars, they're losing you know, kids they went to school with, and then they'll see an entrepreneur. WeWork is easy to pile on, but just think of WeWork, and these guys that are curing polio, and they're like, you're splitting up this office into eight, you're not, you know. So they, their bullshit detector is way up, and there's no real, like, etiquette of them not saying, yeah, this is a stupid thing. It's like, it's a very weird dynamic when you follow some of these journals, and I know them, like, I've known them for 20 years, right, so like, it's kind of, so my point is, you can't just show up to them and be like, we're changing the world, or even if it's not a bullshit press release, like you're just like, hey, this is a new app to do this or that. They're like, they don't care, right? You do have to kind of get there before, develop a relationship, become a resource. So if you launch an app for blind people, why are you an expert on blind people? Why is it that apps are successful or not? And you know what? It takes a bit of work. Maybe a blog, nowadays just post on LinkedIn, I go crazy on LinkedIn, Twitter, you don't even have to do that much, but you do have to establish your credibility and get out there a bit more. And also be there to kind of like just be a sounding board. You may not get a quote at first, nothing. They're gonna pick your brains, they're gonna get like intel from the industry to make sure that what they're writing is enough. Then when the article goes out, you're like, hey, did you write something? And they're like, yeah, sure, they just give you a link. They're like, you click on it, you do a control app, because we're all like that, to see where's my quote, how misquoted was I, how much damage control do I need to do. And if you're lucky, you weren't even mentioned because you don't have any explaining or backtracking to do because they're like, yeah, too bad. I don't need to quote you. Once you do that for five years, because that thing is done overnight and life is about persistence, when you have, a, it doesn't need to be five years, but it's like once you build some kind of rapport. So I get so many journalists that will pay me and they're like, what do you think of this? And it's just kind of like this relationship you develop so that if then I'm like, look, we launched, for example, this new initiative, it's kind of like, what if Def Jam, MTV, and Rolling Stone magazine was created at once on YouTube under the same roof, it's called Sound Mojo. Do you want to talk about why a Watch Mojo would even do something this crazy? Sure, why not? Because it may fit into something else I'm working on. And then it's a relationship, so you gotta be a challenge. You gotta be a bit like reverse psychology. It's like relationships. If you go to a girl, I love you, let's date. She's like, okay, check, next guy. Yeah. I hate to say it, it's the same thing with VCs. My number one with VCs, it was like I was telling them on the first day that I wanted to partner with them, marry them, have kids, and help them make money. I should not have done that. I should have been a challenge. And I hate life that is all about that, but as human beings, being animals, it's kind of like that. It's a very natural reaction. And that's why dating advice column is coming back from 15 years ago. Pre-Tinder, so don't take anything I say. <laughs> now, be before we turn it to the floor, I would like to ask you, what are the new initiatives you're working on? What are the new challenges? And where do you see Watch Mojo going in two or three years? Sure, sure. Great question. So, ten, uh, sorry. Three years ago, we celebrated our 10 year anniversary and numbers are symbolic. And I could tell that I'd gone through waves of risk take, crazy risk taker to crazy adverse, uh, risk averse. And I kind of sensed that I was getting a bit too like, you know, risk averse. I wasn't taking shots down the field anymore. It was a lot of running plays, a lot of short passes. So I kind of said either I gotta step aside, find somebody else, sell the business, or start taking risks. So we kind of launched Watch Mojo 2020, which is where do we want to be in 2020? And this is not revisionist history. This actually is how it went down. I read the publisher, which is the story of Time Magazine. So he kind of got me crazy into going back into risk taking. And I kind of view this parallel that Watch Mojo was this brand that could really grow into many more things. So we invested in these 10 areas. Some made a lot of sense, building a direct sales force. Some were a bit kind of like obvious, going international. 
Some were a bit more crazy, you know. And so of those, we didn't burn like $20 million in, in it, but we kind of invested a good amount. We recruited a lot of people, Paul being a gentleman sitting in the audience, uh, to come and just level up and go wide and go deep. And honestly, some of those things were like A's, some of them were B's, a few of them were C or F's, a few of them were NA's. We didn't really, we spread ourselves too thin. The thinking was, it was like to test it, like control group, at the same background, at the same kind of macro level world, which ones of these things would make sense. So today, it's all about continuing to expand Watch Mojo into new places, and it's like moving from just being a YouTube channel, which has now moved on. We're also very big on Snap. Our Watch Mojo Espanol channel is very big. It's, we're like a very large presence in Mexico. Uh, many other things like China on all these platforms. So it's really to kind of like evolve from just like a YouTube uh, channel to uh, this kind of diversified media company. But I do think that the takeaway is, is Watch World Joe really have the runway to be its independent company, to be a Condé Nast or Hearst of its era? Or does it make more sense like ESPN to flourish under Disney or MTV to flourish under Viacom? And I think if you look at the nature of the web, how there's no barriers to entry, anybody can come tomorrow, it's constant competition. Uh, and and the, these platforms that you know wake up one day and they're like, we don't want channels with W and Watch Mojo could evaporate from history. I am now more like, I'm glad as an entrepreneur I pushed it to see how far it could go. And I still have the drive to keep growing it. But I do see the merits in being like, hey, every six months, we, every two weeks, we get a company coming to us saying, you're building something that we can never build. And if I can find, the, the benefit now, bring it all together is, if I can, because I don't have outside investors, I don't have this fiduciary duty to just sell it to the highest bidder, even though they're gonna drive it off a cliff. But if I can find an organization where there's like a good fit, a good kind of like, you know, balance of values, principles, priorities, then I do naively, but sincerely feel that I could keep growing it and it becomes one of like the, you know, the next just pour rire or, you know, and, and to that generation that's on YouTube, it's already bigger, right? So that's kind of where I am. Uh, it's a good place to be, and you know, try not to try to just sleep all the time. Perfect. Cool. We're gonna turn to the floor, and we have a microphone. I'm just gonna also feed the meter, so I don't get a ticket. Let's go. On. <laughs> all right. Anyone has any question? Um, yeah, I got a Crash. quick question. Yes. You can go first. I saw you first. Bring the mic. Uh, hi, uh, Ash. Thank you for your insights. Um, my question was, I would like to get your advice on for people who are starting, or for brands that are getting into YouTube and, and thinking about using it as a way to draw traffic back to their business. For example, in my case, I'm building a platform called Co-Teacher, and it's a place where teachers can connect and advise and coach one another, and I'm interested in connecting with teachers who themselves are content makers and have brands, and I'd like to play in the YouTube space and use that to drive traffic back to uh, co-teacher.com. So I wanted to get your advice on as YouTube is, even, is changing as a platform and you know the ways that people rise up break into YouTube are continuing evolving. How would you advise a brand like ours to start in YouTube today? Sure, so online video is what I call the Afghanistan of the media landscape, meaning everybody goes in there thinking they're gonna come out victorious, making money, you know, victory flags, and everybody retreats because Afghanistan is hard. It's hard terrain, the people, the, you study the history. It's true. YouTube is like the capital, you know, like the, the strong, the, the, the Taliban. Like it's just this whole thing that nothing makes sense. They're crazy, and YouTube is very different. What is, that, what is the point I'm making? Don't try to use YouTube to somehow siphon people away. There are many, I'm sure you're very smart, very hardworking, but there are nothing but casualties of people, Watch Mojo included, who try to get people to leave YouTube to come. If you are going to use YouTube, it is because you are a believer, a supporter of the community, you understand how it works, and you're gonna build a presence natively on it, okay? You can do a lot of things to get people to come back. But if I'm sitting here and not sleeping in a back alley in a refrigerator box, it's because I didn't think that the goal was to drive people back. I, I was not kidding off. I was like, yeah, you know, YouTube is great, but we're gonna get people back to 10.08. Nope. 
and sorry, to get down with Zora that way. I was like, I'm gonna embrace it. YouTube's gonna be my wife. I love my wife. No, symbolically, and and that's the only way you're gonna succeed. But if you do that, you'll be sitting there. I'll be sitting there, right? So that's the only way you'll succeed, and not just YouTube. Previously MySpace, previously Friendster, Snap, Facebook, uh, TikTok, Crapster in the future, whatever. That's the thing. Now, education is huge. Look at the Khan Academy. So I think you're something that there's a, you know, you hear product market fit. I wrote an article about like platform format fit. It's just search platform format fit. There's like one article in the world. And, but but I, I think, but if you focus on YouTube and focus there, you'll have success. But it'll take you a while because there's so much fun. But that's my advice. And I know it's not what you want to hear, but I can sit here and be like, oh, you know, this is what you got to do to get people back. People don't go back. People are still more loyal to YouTube than any channel. And I know that's different than people who are more loyal to Game of Thrones and HBO, but YouTube is not, is the Taliban. It's something very different. If YouTube execs knew that I was calling them the Taliban, by the way, I don't think they'd be very happy. It's an analogy, it's not a perfect analogy. Yes. Oh, sorry, yes, you had a question. You had a question. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, something I just want to wonder, like, the name Watchmojo, sorry. Yeah, the things I wonder is the name Watchmojo, where did it come from? Like, uh, when you have the inspiration for that one? Inspiration. The truth is, I was watching Austin Powers, and all of a sudden, the word Mojo Supreme entered my head. I liked Mojo because like Virgin was a name that could be, you know, applied to everything. It wasn't used by any media company, which I thought was very weird. Mojo is not chauvinist, it's charisma, it's confidence, it's aura. Uh, so Mojo Supreme was this incubator, and then we had like Meta Mojo, which was a search engine. We had this product that was like Groupon meets Twitter, which is actually, if anybody here wants to bring that back with me, contact me, called Street Mojo. And we also had, but my, where I knew in my gut that would be the most likely to succeed, meaning it was early enough, and I, my comparative advantage, if you think of Plato, you know, what's your principle of specialization, was Watch Mojo, because it sounded better than I Mojo. And I also knew, having worked at search engines, that people would eventually search for Watch something. Mm -hmm. So I felt like if people are like, Watch Kimmel, Watch SNL, if Watch was in the URL, wouldn't be bad. But then YouTube came along and it was all about platforms. It was less about search, and it was more about social than search. And it was all about distribution over destination. But it was basically that. It was like all these mojos and watch mojo made sense. Cool. And you got the idea in 2006. Well, Mojo Supreme entered my head in 99 or 2000, but I never used it until I started an incubator in 2003, 4 when I started to dabble. And all of the early projects were tech, so it wouldn't ironically violate my non-competition. Watch Mojo launched around 2006, uh, but the Mojo portfolio, which ended up just being Watch Mojo, that was the kind of era. Okay, that's cool, thanks. Do you have, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Actually, I, in the first half of your talk, you mentioned you were losing money, losing real cash every month. So finally, I guess you ran out of your own money. Yeah. But you never said you had the fear that the banks would pull their line of credit or whatever you arranged with them. That's interesting. Well, we were definitely not too big to fail. Like, it wasn't like we owed them 10 million or 100 million or a billion or anything like that. We owed them like hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands. I, I will say, though, that again, people do. When I didn't have capital, I had character, I had candor, I had integrity. You know, I remember when I finally set up like um, when I finally set up like um, what do you call it? When you factor your invoices, the guy was like, "Okay, so let's say you can't pay us back, and like you want to basically like find a way not to pay us back. Like, what would you do?" And it was the first time in my life I could not answer the question. I always have an answer for everything, but I was like, "Look, I guess in the, after like ten minutes of struggling." I was like, look, I guess I just would find a way to do it or just tell you. But it was never like, I'm going to screw you, right? And he was like, wow. It's like, nobody's giving me that answer. He was like, we'll do the deal, right? So I, I never had the fear that the banks would do it. I did have the fear of like dying and leaving all this debt to my wife who wasn't necessarily aware. So I did like set up all these insurances to pay off the debt because I was like, it would suck twice as hard if she found out. <laughs> oh, that sucks, but... <laughs> Again, I, I, okay, but also, because I was like good at finance and accounting, all legit, I knew that I could always go get credit lines and 
find a way to, you know, and we had good clients. I never changed, I never chased speculative clients. So when I go to the bank, they would be like, this guy's on doing videos and online and it's not porn, but his clients are bell. I was like, it can't be porn if it's like, we had deals with Simpatico and YouTube was still Googled early on. They weren't paying a lot, but they knew what Google was. So it was like, the clients were like, okay, like he studied finance. He's like, you know, mama, ask man. It was like, they meet me, I talk them into submission. They're like, all right, all right, let's sign. Let's get out, get out. <laughs> I gotta go home. So I was never afraid of that, but I was afraid of many other things. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, I'm sorry about your injunction. Uh, Do you work at Faskin? Yes, oh, I'm from Faskin, but I'm from the startup team, so okay. yeah. It's all good. I, even my co-founders assume me water under the bridge and I laugh. I, I like the Faskin guys who I'm connected to now when one of them became a judge. Although, not on his page. I'm very modest about that. Everybody who wants to hear, I go, you know, Mr. Sinat used to be uh, a lawyer. He's now a judge. Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure the injunction people know your story. and you know. <laughs> That I share it widely. <laughs> I will. Uh, so, uh, my question is that uh, you mentioned when you started your business, you brought your wife in and you recruited three co-founders. Um, Oftentimes, because I work at the startup group, I see startups don't succeed or they die because the founders couldn't agree or they just go in a different direction and fight all the time. So how, how did you know those people are the people you need? And if down the road, if there's any uh, you know, disagreement with startup, is there any startup co-founders, is there any advice that you can sure. share? That is a great question. So there's, I would say, three things. One, I knew right away, I, made, I brought, brought up soccer because I wanted to make this point. You could be a, a, a starter, you could be a closer. When I play soccer, I'm definitely more of a closer. It's a big net. I have a great team behind me, they'll do the fancy, fancy moves. If they get the ball to me, it's a big net, I'll score. In business, I'm a starter and a finisher. I know I'm not a middle guy. If I had to, I could do all the things in the middle. But that my comparative advantage is coming up with crazy ideas, finding the people to feed it to, then coming back to catch it or, or test it, and then be like, I delegate and all that. I would say that's one. So I knew that I needed the people in the middle, regardless of age, experience. And also because we were going on like online video, I actually didn't want people that came from Mesoamerica Canada or traditional. Two, I only see the good in people. So even though my boss ended up suing me and people thought he was crazy, I think he was a great guy. And I think I, I wasn't in a situation, we talk about mental health, you don't know what people go through. I'm not saying he's had anything, but I put myself in his shoes not better as a boss making payroll. So I only look at the opportunities he gave me and all that. But I had so much friction at the end with him that I always said, I don't want to ever do that to my team. And that means to delegate. Now my problem was I sometimes threw people in the pool and I forgot to go check on them. One of the things I told Paul was I said, Paul, I trust you, you're very experienced. I may bother you even less so than the others. So you have to come to me if you need something, but Paul and I have only been working for a couple of years. But thirdly, I also knew that a lot of my problems with my old, like the dishonesty and distrust came because founders rightfully go and hire the Faskins and, and others to draft these fancy, fancy documents. And then when VCs come, they delete everything and start to pit partners against each other. I, having experienced that, but also being candid to say, look, realistically, I'm the only one that's gonna be putting money into this. You guys are gonna to have to trust me because I don't wanna go through six rounds of redrafts and re-amendments upon amendments where you're gonna each time lose faith in me. But you will not work, regret working with me. And I said, like you, well, you could say a lot of them, we all have faults. I said, but you'll never say or think that I'm on to you and like the things that matter, you'll be happy with. And that's very unique because I'm not driven by money. I'm not driven, like I wouldn't steal even a billion dollars, let alone a hundred dollars, right? So, so I kind of emphasize the things that matter. Um, and again, I think being a decent human being goes a long way when you don't have money. You know, you, you treat people right, you give them opportunity. Now, the thing that a challenge is getting to the size that we got, I went back this year to interviewing everybody again. Not because I need to as a power trip, but I realized it creates a bond People get to see you, they feel your, your, your fiber. Whereas otherwise, they just assume things. You know? And as much as you create opportunities, I also realize the paradox of management and motivation, you end up starting to spend 80% of your time on 20% of the people that are causing problems. And you know, at first I used to think attrition was bad. Attrition is great. 
You know, I tell people, and I know people lie to you, I go, everybody's replaceable, starting with me. Doesn't mean you're not unique, but why would I build a system where if one piece is gone, it falls apart? Now, I also said it, even though we have a lot of leverage in this city, I'm gonna be extra nice to you because I, you're gonna be here for a while. So I've always taken a very contrarian approach to things because the, the school books and the lessons are good, but you gotta apply them and you gotta actually practically be like, well, what does this look like? So with my founders, I was very straight up. I didn't tell them anything, but then I was like, hey guys, surprise, these VCs came and the myth of the entrepreneur, I get these special votes and you guys suckers. Oh, sorry, I said that out loud, right? So every time when I had to like demonstrate character and integrity, um, I did, and the few times in my career where I've kind of had to say, look, I, I made this decision because of reasons A, B, and C. Factor X, Y, Z happened. For these reasons, I'd like to take this different route. How do you feel about that? Are you cool? If somebody is unhappy, I go, please give me the opportunity, and it's not empty words. I like that. I like to prove myself to people. I like people to be like, hey, if we need to resolve something, let's get ash. I'm far more driven by that. Send me to the Middle East, you know, than like saying I, I built a unicorn that is worth whatever because some private equity was just more eager than the other private equity, right? So it does go back to principles and values, but it's really hard to stick to that. Life and, and entrepreneurship is about not giving in to the temptations of evil and the shortcuts. And, you know, it's really easy to say great things on a mission statement, but then when you're like, shit, I may not make payroll. And that's the thing, even through all that time, a really interesting stat is I never miss payroll. One time, one of the times I had to use a Visa cash advance check, just as a you know, sh really short term, I told the team pay would be one day late, and it came the next day. So it, it's what drives you, right? So basically. But that's a great question. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, so I understand that you started this, you know, only with your wife and a couple of friends or whatever. So I guess at that point, it's really easy to get like consistency throughout your content and mm -hmm. keep the quality high, but how do you keep the quality high and keep the content consistent and relevant, you know, throughout your whole organization, throughout the whole world, uh, you know, as, as you scale and hire more and more people? Yeah, that's a great question, very uh, in the trenches question. So that was one of the reasons why I couldn't raise capital, right? Because a lot of investors were thinking it was a company called Demand Media. Demand Media was a content farm, and they were like bragging that they were a content farm, but it was a scalable model, but it was like scaling to crap, basically, you know? And, and so for us, I would always stress balance. Admitting, I'm not saying we're in perfect equilibrium, but I said, you gotta balance quality, quantity, frequency, consistency, brand safety, so that people know what they're signing up for. So we could sign these deals and get some licensing revenue because people would be like, your next videos are gonna be as good. So what did that mean? Trusting my team. To come to me and say, look, Ash, I get it right now, we don't want to hire people, but we can't just grow through, let's say we're 10 full-time and we have 15 freelancers, we can't add another five freelancers, we're gonna to need to have three more full-timers because there's a ratio between full-time and part-time. They literally like stopped me as I was going to like get a coffee, I was like, all right, that's good, I didn't know that, do it. Instead of my old boss, God bless his soul, who would be like, okay, go hire them, and then the next day ask me why, and then be like, why did you hire them? And, because he wasn't as comfortable trusting people and delegating, right? So I kind of knew that if in that moment I just give them the support they need, they're good. They're going to go home. They're going to have a beer to take the edge off. But they're not going to be walking home swearing, being like, what am I doing? This guy's crazy, right? So that was basically it. It was always to listen to your team. You know, if your generals are like, we need more soldiers here. We need more of this. Like I used to tell them, I'm like, even if we're dirt poor, insolvent, I was like, if you need the better computer, get the better computer. You know, but no, like I don't believe in, and I'll tell you why. Let's say you hire somebody out of school, and I don't believe in like unpaid internships, you know, but I was like, let's pay them a rookie contract because we're gonna invest in them. I go, yeah, but then don't turn around and go buy thousand dollar chairs that you sit in your reception for five minutes a day. Cause it's really douchebaggy then to be like, we're gonna just buy these, that, I mean, again, we're not Ernst and Young, right? But I was like, because you do have like people, like I know it's weird, but you got to go to psychology and sociology, right? So. You gotta understand people, and you gotta understand that people see things very differently than you. That's the point, like when you say you got self-awareness, you kinda go, when I'm gonna say this, and when you talk about mistakes, it's the times when I didn't do that as well. You know, you've heard, write the email, save it in draft, send it to yourself. 90% of the shit, the stuff that goes in my head, I don't get out, even though I talk a lot. 
Society's not ready for it, you know? So to the point is, you gotta listen to your team, because uh, that's also then when you win the points, when it matters and they stay with you. Um, and it's hard, sometimes you overshoot, you undershoot, but if you don't make any fatal mistakes, you can always recalibrate, it's like cooking. You always know when to put a little bit more water, a little bit more this. It's not like baking. It's such creative work. But like, how do you keep a consistency across all your? Well, products? we have a okay, So we have a lot of quality control people. We have a lot of like people that check every part of every video, right? Like that's the point of, you know, when it comes to cost, I actually believe low enough is good enough. We don't have a policy to minimize costs. It's like optimize costs because well, if you don't have so many quality controlling it, we once erroneously played top 10 national anthems, the Nazi German anthem. None of us grew up listening to the Nazi German anthem. How would we know? We didn't have a German person on. Now we have a German channel. At the time, we would have put it through that extra layer. And so the morning, Saturday morning, I used to read the emails and check it. And I'm like, oh my god. So I emailed my good German friend and I said, Christian, I think we made a little bit of a boo-boo. And he's like, oh my god. I was like, I know what we have to do. We rarely put videos down. And we fixed it, and we, we were candid with our audience. You know, So it's just like little things, even like reading the comments. I could have been like, oh, it's Saturday. I'm going to go come back Monday. Major diplomatic incident. <laughs> but that's it. And you got to kind of like take your job seriously, but not take yourself too seriously. And you know, when that happened, I wasn't yelling at anybody. I was like, quick, what are the, where was there a breakdown? What do we need to do? Perfect is the enemy of good. Yeah? Last question? Yes. Um, when I think of Vice Mojo, I think of Top 10. Yes. And when talking about contents, I feel that the Top 10 is like a framework of content. Would you classify the Top 10 as a golden goose of Vice Mojo? Well, going back to Moses' Ten Commandments, I think if you put it in the context of 2019, this proliferation of content creation, everybody's a creator, short attention span, it's more that it checks off all the requirements of getting a lot of people to care about a topic. You know what the end game is. I write a lot, and I won't lie. Like when you're writing, you're like, these eight words are necessary in this sentence. As an editor, you're like, I needed two words here. But the top 10, the viewer, the reader knows what they're gonna get. They know, like I won't watch the life and times of Beyonce. But I'll watch Top 10 Beyonce songs because I'm like, damn, what are her best songs, right? And I can say that about any topic. I will watch a Top 10 on, like people when they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you guys did Top 10 whatever, National Amusement Parks. I'm like, we've done Top 10 sandwiches. <laughs> because we like to be like, can we debate, first of all, what is a sandwich? You know, we literally almost like fight to be like, is a hamburger a sandwich? That's how crazy we are. We, we did a ranking top 10 brutal dictators because I was like, I'm interested to see if we could cover this. Now, what we could get away with in 2013, we can't get away in 2019, not just because of what's happened in society, but because we are seen as the Disney or like the big corporation on YouTube. So we have to kind of be more careful. But yeah, in a way I feel like it's not necessarily a top 10. It's just, it's a time tested format that appeals to a lot of people, and it's a bit like of a head fake. People think we're, we're specialty is film, but our specialty is ranking. You know what I mean? And that is something that could be applied to it. But we also don't want to be typecast, and that's one reason why it took me six years, because I was like, well, no, I'm a straight writer, and I'm a straight producer. I don't want to just be known as a top 10. But eventually you're like, I want to win. Like, it's not a sellout thing, but it's like, I want to serve the fans. And if I have this kitchen, and I know what people like, I'm going to give them that. Um, well, I, I don't know whether you're a specialist in tops or like in rankings or like in engagement and uh, empathy, like you see, at, like it seems as an individual. So thanks for uh, putting those uh, truths and values here at, for entrepreneurs. That's great. Uh, I was wondering from a media perspective, you talked about the Canoe versus Quebec or whatnot, and we all know where the landscape is. But at the same time, from a democracy perspective, like we've seen what's going on, filter bubbles or not, uh, the power of media powerhouses as platforms like YouTube, Facebook, etc. Before we had TV that everybody would watch, and at least we would be able to debate around the water cooler and be able to have the same information. Today it's personalized, it's drawn to like more views, etc. 
do you see that like democracy is doomed or is there a way to re-engage with citizens through those new medias to have a better balance of powers in a way? So I guess we're going to spend the next two hours discussing this. Okay, no. So yeah. Top 10 reasons, yeah. top 10 reasons yeah. why we're so, not doomed. No, I mean, okay, look, there's two things. One is right now, it's this unique time when a lot of young people are drawn to socialism, even billionaire capitalists are saying the system doesn't work. And I think there's a role of entrepreneurship to level the gap between income and uh, wealth equality. You can check out Fox in the Hen House, which is the, a documentary I produced. It covers that. My short answer is we get lost in semantics when it comes with democracy and socialism. I still think that, that this is the greatest time to be alive because things like child mortality, you know, even like things like the Me Too movement, which was long overdue, it's net net a good time to be alive. But we're, we're now double click, and this is the second minute and final minute. When it comes to these platforms, there's been this massive shift of power and kind of framework where a lot of money fueled by low interest rates, cheap capital, has fueled a lot of young technical brains that maybe some of them study liberal arts, but a lot of them didn't necessarily study history and sociology and all that as much as they should, who were kind of given cap knowledge to build these platforms and not necessarily ask what happens if I do X or do this. And it's not like their VCs and private equity people care because they just care about maximizing. So there's always a regression to the mean. So to conclude, we've gone too far where we've, we've accepted this laissez-faire approach to these platforms. And I think what you're now seeing is not bubbling up through copyright or even democracies. It started with the EU saying, I'm sorry, Google and Facebook. We went through the Holocaust. You can't say that the Holocaust did not happen. So we are going to force you to take down such content. And because these are global, or get fines, and finally to wrap it up, because these are global platforms, instead of saying, well, we're going to have a rule book for the EU and a rule book for the US, we're just going to have one rule book, and we're going to go with this anti-Holocaust, uh, Holocaust denying is not permitted rule. That is setting precedence now for everything else. Democracy, fake news. In the trenches, there's still this back and forth. But we are going to look back at the moment now where there was like a recalibration to a more level playing field. Because I talked to Google execs. They talk very differently than they did two years ago. They're no longer saying, well, look, it's not our problem. We're neutral. They're saying, no, no, no. We have responsibility. We have to balance all stakeholders, including the viewers, but advertisers and community as a whole. So it's already changed. And I think the internet will look increasingly like TV and newspapers. Whether or not it's in three years or five years, it'll all start to resemble more and more. I have uh, one last question to bring you back to your element. Uh, can you give us a top 10 of the best advice for young entrepreneurs, uh, whether on YouTube or outside of YouTube? Yeah, well, I mean, just not in order. I think understand that the best lessons you learned in life are not just in business or computer programming. You really do need to think of psychology, sociology, history. There's a lot of good stuff there. Two, um, I absolutely think, two, I'll try to go faster. Two, I really believe in the concept of principle and specialization by Plato, which I referenced in my first book. Three, I really believe when we talk about mental health and just like getting a sense of not losing your mind. Freud, what did he say when you sleep? You compartmentalize data and you process things and maybe really pissed off at night before you decide something, sleep on it in the morning, you're like, what did I care? Um, four, understand, put yourself in other shoes is more than just saying it. Understand how people interpret your words. Five, to that point, the difference between um, your perception, uh, your intentions and how things are perceived are your words and actions. And every day I, I, make, I drop the ball at least a few times there. Um, six, uh, persistence. And I'll just wrap it up with actually my formula for success is seven things. So this becomes a top five and a plus seven. <laughs> success for startups is vision, ambition, execution, persistence, luck, timing, and focus when you know what to focus on. So that's what you need. So you got to do that to whatever it is you want to do. And I'll close off with this. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. And entrepreneurship is not necessarily for everybody at any given point. I was not ready to be an entrepreneur when I was leaving school. I was avoiding responsibility. I mean, not saying I was crazy, but I didn't want the responsibilities. 
And later on, I developed into that. So it's fine to be an entrepreneur. It's fine to be an executive. It's fine to work at a nonprofit. There's no shelf life on you know when you should be an entrepreneur. But I think a lot of people these days are drawn by entrepreneurship. It's no longer like decades ago was mom, my mom wants me to be a doctor, lawyer. Then 15, 20 years ago was I'm going to be an investment banker. Then it was I'm going to be a VC. Today everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is hard. And most people are not entrepreneurs. Um, and they shouldn't be entrepreneurs. There's no harm in trying it. But be honest with yourself. Maybe the time is off. Um, but you know, life's, you know, business and entrepreneurship is a means to an end. You know, entrepreneurs work a few years like no one can, no one wants to, so they live the rest of their life like no one can. But those few years are pretty darn hard. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.